grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was in the car, we were taking the always long and boring trip to New Orleans. And I was bellering in the back seat, when are we going to get there? It's so boring. It's so flat in this stinking state. Where are we? I'm hungry. I'm tired. Let's get there already. And my mother had to sternly turn around after about 15 minutes of this. I felt she went and gave me a lot of grace and a lot of slack, but I ran out of it, and she looked at me and said, Matthew, that's enough. This isn't about you. Get over it. We're going to see your sister. This is the kind of reminder that we oftentimes need in this life. The reminder that sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own ego and our own things and our own pride, and we have to be reminded by a loved one. We have to be reminded by a relative or a friend, guys, get over yourself. It's not about you. Good friend of mine, uh, just a few years ago, when one of those large hurricanes hit the southern areas in the Gulf of Mexico, took a group of church members down there. He had about 15 volunteers, and they went from house to house, cleaning, scrubbing, cleaning it out, taking all the trash out of the house. And this person, obviously from the state of Wisconsin, has never seen this kind of horror, this kind of destruction, and namely, this kind of smell, the smell of rot and death. And so this person started to complain constantly. Hey, it's hot out here. Oh, and it smells so bad. And when is supper? When do we get a break? And on and on this person went. And so the pastor had to be the bad guy, and he went up to this person and said, uh, you do realize this has nothing to do with you. You do realize that these people have had their homes destroyed. You do realize that we came down here to be servants, to serve. And ironically, we came down here so that we could mimic the actions of our Savior himself, to be like Christ. Please, get over yourself. These are words that our sinful nature and our ego and our pride don't like to hear. These are words that we honestly hear and we sometimes just scowl, avoid, shrug our shoulders and say, well, but we need to hear it. And today, there are a couple of other men in our lesson that needed to hear it as well. You see, James and John... They went up to Jesus, and they wanted to ask him a question. And this question that they wanted to ask him, they wanted him to say yes. You can hear that in the way they approached him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, I've asked a lot of things from a lot of people throughout my years, and I believe that this probably is the most unsuccessful way of getting whatever you need done. I don't think I've ever approached my mom in that way. She probably would have hit me upside the head. And you look at this, and you don't really say, hey, I'm about to ask you a question, but you've got to say yes. What kind of person would ever say, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever it is, then yes, I answer yes. Well, no. Nobody does that. And so Jesus, he remains noncommittal, and he says, well, what do you want me to do for you, he asks. And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, to understand this, they were looking for something. They were looking for their own position of glory and honor. They wanted to be somehow a little higher up than the other ten. They wanted to separate themselves in some way. And to think about this, I mean, when they're looking for this glory and this laud and this honor all for themselves, it really is to compare themselves, isn't it? They wanted something that the other ten wouldn't get. And wouldn't you believe that if our human nature hears this kind of thing, what do you think you would do with it? 
Jesus said, I get to sit at his right, and, and my brother over here, he gets to sit at his left. Na, 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 that's mine. Yes, indeedy. You didn't get it. I did. That's the kind of sinful pride that we have. And each one of us has it. Each one of us compares ourselves to each other, and we want to think that there is some greater thing in store for us because we are so much better. Kind of like the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? You have in the temple of God and one saying, hey, God, you're lucky that I am one of your guys, man. But I'm not like that tax collector over there. We sometimes approach God in a bit of a prideful and we're wrapped up in ourselves and our ego needs to be put in its place. And we need to be reminded, get over yourself. It's not about you. James and John had to be reminded that as well. Jesus says, you don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. And when the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. So here we are. We have this little conversation. James and John, they are convinced that they can indeed drink the cup that Jesus is going to drink and be baptized in the same baptism that Jesus was. They believe that they have full rights to this place of glory in God's glory. And then all of a sudden the other ten disciples hear about it. They become indignant. Some say they became indignant because they were a team and so all twelve of them were on the same team and they were all of a sudden off the team. They were going apart from the rest of the group. But in all honesty, when you look at it from our own human nature, what do you think happened? Maybe they were indignant because maybe all ten of those guys didn't think about asking Jesus this same question sooner than these two buddies. Maybe they were actually indignant because, oh man, I was going to ask Jesus to have that place of glory. No, James and John asked them. You see, when it comes to our sinful nature, when it comes to our ego, it needs to be put in its place. And so if it's not all about me, Jesus, if it's not about me, and how do I get over myself then, Jesus? And Jesus then tells us. He looks at the ten who were indignant about this, and Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So the Lord Jesus shows them, this position that you are seeking is not one for you to have, but if you want to be great, if you want to be first, if you want to be this, you got to be a servant. You got to be a slave. He also gives us an insight to James and John and their motivation. Because all of a sudden he points out, you know, it's the Gentiles and the high officials that lord their authority over other people, but not you guys. You see, he's pointing out to the 12 disciples who are there, guys, this isn't about ranking. We're not trying to see which place we have amongst each other. It has nothing to do with you. Get over yourselves has everything to be about being a servant. Now, when we look at this section, a lot of people would like to say, well, Jesus is teaching them humility. And in part, he is, but it's more than that. Jesus just isn't saying, hey, if you guys need to be humbled, you should be a servant for a day or a slave for a day, and that will teach you something that you will then be able to take with you the rest of your life. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that we ought to take upon ourselves this attitude, this life transformation, that we're not supposed to just simply view the qualities of what it is like to be a slave or a servant, but that we should literally transform our lives to have it be a life of service. 
we don't like hearing that because, again, our ego shouts out, well, if I'm serving others, what about me? Everything in the world is about me. How is this going to work out for me? And the Lord Jesus shows us. He shows us that, indeed, to be a servant, we must be like Christ. And he compares, then, the servant to himself. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. <laughs> Jesus Christ, our Lord, came into this world to put on display for us a servant-like attitude that none of us could even fathom. To think that you would wake up every single day and perform all of the actions that you would, not for yourself. That is what Jesus did. Every single day he woke up and went about his life, living it perfectly, not for himself, but for you and for me. Every single day the servant of Jesus Christ woke up and did everything fought against every temptation, not for himself, but for you and for me. He went to the cross, and he died there, a servant to you and to me, to do what you and I could not do. Indeed, Jesus Christ shows us what it's like to be a servant, what it's like to look at the mass of humanity and do everything, not for himself, but for them to pour out of his own effort everything for all mankind, to rescue us from our sins, to do everything for each and every one of us. That's what it's like to be a servant. That's what it's like to get over yourself and realize it's not about you, it's about being a servant like Christ. So what do you do with that? What do you do when you see how you can live your life as a forgiven Christian, one who has been shown the example of what it's like to be a perfect servant, putting the needs of others far ahead of your own? Jesus says then, use it. Go out and use this and be a servant to the people around you. Because there are plenty in this world, and we can see them, who all they do is serve themselves. They're wrapped up in that me-first mentality. They don't know God, and they don't know anything about this heaven or hell because they just simply view this as eat, drink, and be merry, and tomorrow I'll die. You have been given the gospel. You have been given the opportunity. You have been shown by Jesus himself what it is to be a servant. So go. Go and share this message with your friends and your family and your neighbors. Go and grow in this message at home. Open up your Bibles and make sure this is not just a Sunday thing, but a daily thing. Go and serve, serving by spreading the gospel with your own mouths in this community. Indeed, to hear this reminder today is one that we should always hear each and every other day, that we got to get over ourselves. We got to get over the fact that it's not about me. We got to get over that because Christ came into this world to rescue us, to be the ransom for all sin for us. That Jesus Christ came into this world so that he could save us, so that we could be equipped to go about in spreading that saving message to others. So friends, let's get over ourselves, okay? Let us actually think about others instead of ourselves. Let us put on Christ as he has draped his robe of righteousness on us, let us wear him proudly in our community, showing others, spreading the news to others that it's about them. It's about the lost souls in this world that they too may be found. Amen. Amen.